few things completely out of existence and etching some of the others. Uh, but I would say that not everything uh, is etched by Darwinism, but many things are. And this was the beginning of the struggles that I had as I tried to make uh, sense of this. The things which I think are dissolved or at least significantly etched by evolution include the days of creation. I don't see any way that we can take evolution on board and have any meaning any longer attached to the days of creation, uh, at least as chronologies. There are uh, interesting uh, theological interpretations of these days, but we lose them as a busy week in which God laid out the uh, created order. The historicity of Adam and Eve, uh, pictured here in Ken Ham's uh, museum, uh, is called into question by the evolutionary story. It's very hard to have these two human beings uh, a few thousand years ago that are the uh, parents of the entire human race. Uh, that's challenged by uh, evolution. Uh, the worldwide flood, of course, uh, never really a central idea for uh, Christians, but the worldwide flood just disappears and has to become some uh, local affair uh, in the Middle East, uh, if it has a historical basis at all. Uh, the fall becomes a very difficult doctrine to interpret. Uh, there are ways, I think, that we can look at the fall, but it, it's, it's hard to uh, sustain the, the fall in the traditional sense once we have a long, slow process of human uh, evolution. The image of God is problematic, much harder to think of what the image of God means when we think of an evolutionary origin for human beings. And all of this creates serious problems for the one of the centerpieces of New Testament theology, and that's the second Adam Christology, where Christ is described as a second Adam. Uh, so if we play around with the first Adam, it becomes a little difficult to maintain the second Adam in quite the same way. So we have to think kind of hard about that. And I think, though, that of these various things that are etched by evolution, that the most challenging issues, the ones, the ones which I think we have to wrestle with because they're so central and so important that we can't allow them to be etched away. So we have to salvage them in some sense. Uh, and perhaps we can do that in a way which energizes them and brings them into dialogue with what we understand about natural history. Uh, so these, I think, are two very critical issues that we have to wrestle with. And I would have to confess that I, I still wrestle with these as I think about this. But I wonder, as I'm wrestling with this, if we cannot bring these on board uh, sort of in the following way. I wonder whether it's possible and I throw these out as, as theological questions, things which, uh, which I think about, but I would leave to the theologians to uh, sort through. But I wonder whether we need to be so parochial as to restrict the image of God just to our own species. Could we allow that the image of God might be something that emerges gradually? Uh, we certainly have, in human experience, Things which we accept do emerge gradually. We talk about uh, an age of accountability for children, and we understand that uh, when children are little, they can't really do things which are wrong or right, uh, but they can gradually learn and then come into a more sophisticated understanding of that. I mean, can we talk somehow about the image of God being something that uh, is present in some kind of partial and anticipatory way in species that preceded us and then comes to uh, full fruition uh, in our species as we are able to be fully open, more fully open to, uh, to God and, and that relationship. I don't see any reason why we can't do that, although we have to kind of rethink things a little bit. And I wonder if the same thing might not be true for the fall. I mean, can we think of our fallen nature not as being something which emerges suddenly in natural history. On Tuesday we're not fallen and Wednesday we are. Uh, but rather a statement about our character which emerges slowly as the processes of natural selection build in and in a pathological selfishness. Uh, is it conceivable that we can understand that this part of our nature, this uh, selfish fallen character that we have, uh, emerges very, very slowly and again is present in some sort of anticipatory way 
in simpler species and then comes to full fruition in the more sinister of our own uh, species like uh, Adolf Hitler. Primatologists speak in these sorts of languages. Primatologists speak of uh, their work with our cousins, the chimps and the bonobos, uh, as if they have simpler versions of many human characteristics. When uh, the great primatologist Jane Goodall was asked, uh, do chimps have souls? Her answer was, look into their eyes. That was all she said. Uh, most primatologists are convinced that if you work with primates very long, you begin to see something that causes you to identify them in ways uh, which are uh, quite eerie. Now, we can try, and this is again a part of this rustling, we, we can try to salvage some of our traditional qualitative distinctions, the, dis the distinction between fallen and unfallen, or having the image of God or not having the image of God. Uh, perhaps if we can maintain qualitative change along the way. But I think what Darwinism pushes us to do is it pushes us to move away from a simplified qualitative categorical scheme into one which is more quantitative, where we think about important human characteristics and we see them emerging quantitatively through time, increasing to some level, and then of course not even being distributed uh, equally among uh, human beings. Now there is a sense in which some people have looked uh, to emergence to try to rescue this. And emergence is a, an interesting uh, interdisciplinary uh, pursuit uh, within science uh, today. People like uh, Stuart Kaufman and Christian de Duve have, have written about how there can be transitions that occur in nature. The transition perhaps from non-life to life, which is what de Duve is talking about in Vital Dust, or the transition from uh, not conscious to conscious and so on. But all of these transitions are also quantitative changes. They may occur at a more rapid pace than what precedes them, but they're still quantitative changes. And so every characteristic that we possess seems to be something which can be present in any amount from zero to 100%. Uh, and think, if you will, as perhaps the clearest example of that, I mean, think about the consciousness of a developing child. A, a one-day-old embry embryo has no consciousness at all. Uh, slowly, that develops. There's some kind of consciousness uh, present in the womb, more after it's born, uh, and then a few years later, it's present in, in a full form. And somehow, it goes from zero to 100%, and there is no point along that path where we can say, there's none present, and now it's all present. So we, we do have these important characteristics which we know are distributed uh, quantitatively. I saw a hand go up. Does, Oh, oh um, uh, emergence is something which uh, came out of, uh, of chaos theory, and it, and it looks at, at particular cir circumstances which, and I don't know what, how much science that you have, but in, in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, you can push complicated systems so that they kind of quickly and suddenly move to a new level of complexity in ways which seem very surprising sometimes. Um, and people have wondered whether some of the things which are very difficult for us to understand about ourselves, like the origin of consciousness uh, or the origin of life, whether those might somehow be emergent and we don't understand the complicated non-equilibrium circumstance in which they arose. But if we could recreate that, then we would understand it better. That's probably too short to be very helpful. Okay, so I've mentioned some of the things which I think we have to struggle with that are negative. But I think that evolution can be, in the words of uh, Arthur Peacock and a few others, a disguised friend of faith. Okay? Uh, somebody around the turn of the dawn of the 20th century said that evolution came in the garb of a foe and did the work of a friend. So there's some things about evolution that I think are actually helpful theologically. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of them to kind of show that this is a, a mixed bag, if you will. So if we look at the evolutionary process as being creative, as having some autonomy, as being able to run uh, to some degree uh, by itself, then 
I wonder if we cannot accept that a 